Horizon TV, the beacon for the nation. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome viewers to the next episode of A Tough Talk. And tonight we're privileged again for the second time due to public demand to be hosting our brother Sheikh Muhammad Saleh. And Sheikh Muhammad Abdullah Saleh is the Muslim chaplain of the University of Nairobi. And he is with us to go and look back at the very, very sensitive issue of Palestine. We know that a few weeks ago, Israel declared unilaterally that Jerusalem will be its capital. What does this portend for the nation of Palestine? Ustad Muhammad Abdullah Saleh, last week you gave us a very marvelous history of the state of Israel and how issues came to be where they are today. Now, due to public demand, viewers have demanded that we go on and explain to them that that was the old historical Palestine, and today they want to hear about the new Palestine. What does the future portend for Palestine? And uh, to start us off, we've heard in uh, all the global media that there's always the reference that there are occupied territories. So if these territories are occupied, why is the occupation still continuing? Welcome to the show. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafi al-anbiya'i wa al-musaleen wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Wa man tabiyahum bi ihsanin ila yawm al-deen amma amma ba'd. قال سبحانه وتعالى بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم سبحان الذي أسرى بأبده ليلا من المسجد الحرام إلى المسجد الأقصى الذي باركنا حوله لنريه من آياتنا إنه هو السميع البصير. Coming to your question, brother Salim. Any territory, it's not only Palestine. any territory globally wherein an occupier has come and occupied that territory, that territory will remain as an occupied territory till they gain their independence. And uh, we have seen recently how so many, few years ago, how so many uh, territories have gained their independence or they were given plebiscite to chalk their way forward. We have heard of East Timur, we have heard of Southern Sudan, and we have heard of other countries. But their countries up to now, or their regions up to now, which are occupied by an occupation. We have uh, Jammu and Kashmir, between India and Pakistan, which is occupied by the Indian, Indians, Indian government. We have Palestine which is still occupied. Why is Kashmir, but now we are not talking about Kashmir, we are talking about Palestine. Maybe another day, another time, you are going to talk about Kashmir also. Uh, why is it that Palestine is still occupied? It was occupied before when we went to history. It was occupied in 1917. It was occupied in 1948 when the Britons and their military left Palestine for Britain and left the Zionist to man that territory. You find that I can see there are uh, ma mainly uh, two major reasons. Mm -hmm. One, from 1917 or before 1917, you know, when, when these Zionist uh, aspirations came up, before 1917, uh, to be exact, in 1895 and maybe 1897, uh, the Zionists, they were able to, to hold some of 
the major political and military powers to aid them. You know, in the early 20th century, the superpower then were mainly Britain and France. America was nowhere to be seen. Therefore, they got hold of Britain. And hence, there was the infamous uh, Balfour Declaration, and then the maneuvering of uh, Hussein, the Emir of Hijaz, Hussein bin Ali to go to Britain, and so on and so forth. Uh, but they, had, they gave them. And when uh, Britain was no longer a superpower, they got hold of the US. And uh, the US now is running the show for the Zionist entity. In Just to understand this word occupied. No. So does it mean that there is hope at the end of the day that uh, they're going to give it up? Or does it mean occupied that they have taken? What is the real situation? The here? real situation is, uh, you can say they have taken totally almost 80% uh, of the Palestinian land. And uh, do they have an intention of giving it back? No, they don't. Well, if they do not have an intention of giving it back, it brings me to uh, my second question. Why can't they unilaterally declare that this is us, we have taken it, and we do not fear anyone because we have taken what we want to take it, given that they have the support of all the powers in the world? Yeah, they, they, they have said not once. They have said so many times that uh, first Palestine, which they call Israel, Israel has been given, to, it is a God-given land. It was given to Abraham, Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam, and his progeny. And to, to his progeny, it's only through Ishaq, Yaqub, and the 12 tribes. Therefore, they have, they have declared not once, not twice, not thrice, many times. And they say that they want an Israeli state with only the majority, majority without any minority. Uh -huh. And if you look into, even they have a, a, a slogan in the Knesset, their parliament, outside the building, they have written, your land, O Israel, is from River Nile to River Euphrates. This is the greater Israel. Mm -hmm. Therefore, even their words, they don't hide. They speak it openly, even to the journalists. And uh, last, uh, in our last program, we didn't mention even the negoci negotiations they were going through with the, with the Palestinians, with Yasser Arafat, the PLO, and the Arab states. After the negotiation and agreeing to what they agree, when they come out, they say, just, that is just a piece of paper. In the recent years, uh, we have seen a situation whereby there's been an escalation in the building of uh, settlements in uh, these occupied territories. The Israeli government has uh, funded uh, for the Jew people to build settlements in occupied lands. Could this be part of the aim that uh, they are showing that uh, this belongs to us and uh, we are not going anywhere? Yes. That is a, that is a sign and a mark that uh, they are not going to relinquish any, they say even an inch of that land is not going to be returned to the Palestinian people. And hence what they do now, they have stringent measures. If your child is found throwing a stone, the building is raised, a settlement is built. And then you go to the camps in, uh, in, your, own, in your own country. That is what they do. And uh, now they, the target is mainly in uh, Jerusalem, mm -hmm. especially now, because the West, but West Jer Jerusalem they have taken in 1967 after the Six Day War. And uh, the already settlements are there. And now their target is in the East Jerusalem, where in up to now the Palestinians are there and uh, they don't want to, to move out. They want to stay there. This is our ancestral, ancestral land, and we are going to live here, die here, even if it is in the camps. The colorful uh, history of the Palestinian question at one point in the 1970s had uh, uh, the 
the, an, an, a player in the name of the Palestinian Liberation Organization. No. And uh, this uh, organization was led uh, by the late uh, Yasser Arafat. And uh, most of us who know about Palestine, we would actually want to refer to him as being one of the people who truly fought uh, the, 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 the struggle. What, what, were, what happened and what led to the failure of the Palestinian Liberation Organization? Mm. Okay. In fact, if you go back into history, the liberation or the war, the struggle for liberation of Palestine did not start in the 70s. Yes. The first struggle for liberation started in 1929 whereby the Palestinians now, uh, from the time of 1918 to 1929, they were using peaceful means. Mm -hmm. There were talks between Hussein and McMahon of Britain. Even some of the Palestinians went to Britain in order to talk to them peacefully, but there was nothing. Mm -hmm. Therefore, in 1929, there was an uprising by the name al Burak Uprising, mm -hmm. whereby now people, the Palestinians, they think that now it is time for us, you know, all the, we have exhausted all the peaceful ways. The only way now these people can hear, the Britons, mm -hmm. then uh, it was under the British pr protectorate. Mm -hmm. The only thing that the British could hear is to have an armed struggle. Mm -hmm. Therefore, and then there was a struggle uh, of Isdin al Qassam from 1935 to 1939. And then there was a, a period whereby there was cessation of uh, hostility or cessation of wars because of the Second World War. 1940, 40, 19, 19, uh, early 40s up to 45 or 46. Mm -hmm. And then the creation of uh, uh, the Zionist state. And then after that, after 1956 war, now the Palestinians, they thought now they should go back to the armed struggle. Mm -hmm. in, 1950, in 1957, PLO, known as the Fatah, yeah. Palestinian Liberation Organization was established in Kuwait, mm. 1957. And then in 1965, first January 1965, now Al Asifa, mm. a wing in the PLO, mm. was established now to directly have a direct confrontation with the Zionist entity. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is a misnomer also to think that this Fatah PLO mm. was uh, started by Yasser Arafat. No, in fact, PLO was started by Abu Jihad. Mm -hmm. But then when Yasser Arafat came on board, he, he became the most he became prominent member. The prominent the member PLO. and he became the president of PLO. Yes. But in 1965 now, uh, it was established, the al Asifa, which means the storm, and now from 1965, they started attacking the, int the Zionist interests all over the world. Uh -huh. In Munich, in Kampala, Uganda, in other places, even here in Kenya. All the interest. But now, uh, towards after the, the Intifada of 1987, the grip, the, uh, Yasser Arafat st uh, started losing grip uh -huh. because of the establishment of Hamas. So could that uh, be one of the key reasons why PLO led uh, to failure? Yeah. That was one of the reasons, but the main reason, they left the arms struggle. In 1990, they left and they say, okay, we don't want to throw the Zionists to the sea or to the river. We want to coexist with the Zionist entity. Um, we want to go back to resolution one, UN resolution 181. Uh -huh. Uh, now that you have uh, mentioned Hamas, we'd really like to know then what happened uh, with PLO and Hamas and the power struggle that was there. We shall be taking a break and uh, when we come back from our break, we'd like you to take us through the journey of transition from the politics of PLO, which was first an armed struggle and then it led to a passive struggle, now to the new politics of Hamas, which uh, unfortunately, as per the records that we have today, has already been labeled to be a terrorist organization, yet it is uh, in power in uh, Palestine. What are your closing thoughts uh, on this? 
my closing, uh, you know, even during the time of Yasser Arafat, there were so many players which we have not mentioned. You know, PLO was one. There were, there were other, other fr factions like PLPF of George Habash, a Palestinian who used to study in uh, Beirut University. And there were other groups which also they took to uh, Armstrong. Oh. Now, in 1987, uh, on uh, exactly 8th December 1987, uh, a lorry of the Zionist uh, uh, was passing somewhere and the Palestinians were, were there, they rammed up to them. Well, we shall be taking yeah. a break and uh, when we come back uh, again, we will be starting off uh, with this incident of where there was a lorry of uh, Palestinians which were rammed onto some uh, Jews in uh, Palestine. No, the opposite. It was the opposite. opposite. The Israeli okay. lorry ramming on the back, Palestinians. Uh, on the incident where no. the Israelis uh, rammed onto Palestinians and from there where did it all go to and the new politics of Hamas. Thank you. Horizon TV, the beacon for the nation. Welcome back uh, to the show and uh, tonight we are discussing the Palestinian issue following the unilateral declaration by Israel that Jerusalem will be their capital uh, of the country and what that kind of decision portends for the intended nation of Palestine. Back to this incident whereby uh, the Israelis decided to ram a lorry onto a crowd of Palestinians. Where did it all start? Okay. Before maybe we start to that, you know, there was this, uh, the PLO question, the achievement. Yes. You know, we did talk about the failure, yeah. but also during that period, they were able to achieve a lot. You know, once you have the power and you are able to struggle, mm. uh, people usually will, uh, will honor you. Mm -hmm. And uh, with this, you know, during the time, especially early 70s, they yes. were honored with uh, membership at the UN. Arab, Arab League mm -hmm. and then observer, st uh, observer status at the UN. And then there were so many resolutions which were passed, which uh, in summary signifies that the, the st Palestinian struggle is a struggle for self-determination mm -hmm. against the occupiers. Therefore, these were some of the achievements. If we go, come back to what happened on 8th December 1987, is uh, a lorry, an Israeli lorry, it was coming from somewhere in Gaza. And then there were laborers going back to, to their houses in the evening. Therefore, deliberately, the driver rammed on to these laborers. Uh, five or four or five were killed instantly. And on ninth, these five Geneza, the five bodies of the martyrs were carried with a crowd, a mammoth crowd. And uh, slogans were chanted, anti-Zionist slogan. And from there now, on ninth, Hamas was born. Quite an interesting piece of history, yeah. how Hamas came into Hamas being. Hamas came into being. Ninth now, there was the, the, the shouting. And uh, one week later, not on ninth, but on 14th, some of the, uh, mem the, the Palestinians who used to live in Gaza, they gathered in a mosque. Uh, these were people who were... Uh, very, very strict in the ob ob uh, observance of uh, Islam. And uh, Ahmad Yassin, Sheikh Ahmad Yassin, who by then was paralyzed, only he was able to move only the head, was chosen as the spiritual leader of Hamas. Islamic. Hamas means uh, Haraka al muqawa al muqawama al islami Islamic resistance movement. 14th December 1987. What are the differences between Hamas and the PLO? The P, Hamas and PLO, the, different, the major P, uh, difference is 
the major force of Hamas was Islam. The major force trying to, to take a PLO forward was secularist and socialist ideals. Therefore, they were far apart. Mm -hmm. And hence, when Hamas was born, PLO saw in Hamas a threat mm -hmm. to its well-being. Mm -hmm. And hence, it didn't pass long mm -hmm. when now Yasser Arafat, in order to garner in power, thought that it is better now let Hamas fight the war, but they should go to the table. Uh -huh. That was in 1991, hardly four years after the establishment or the formation of Hamas. Uh, we see today that what has happened is that uh, Hamas has been isolated. Could it be that uh, Hamas has been isolated because of its strict adherence to the tenets of Islam? Or is it Hamas posing a bigger threat mm -hmm. to other nations apart from the Israeli nation? Hamas is posing a great threat to the Arab regimes the world over, uh, Muslim Arab regimes, especially the regimes which are clinging to sultanship and kingship. Mm -hmm. And hence you find that when Hamas won the democratic election in Gaza and uh, Ismail Hanea was chosen as the prime minister, most of the Arab states, they fought against Hamas. And in fact, it is the Arab state who gave us a signal to the Zionist, uh, Zionist entity to attack Gaza in 1996 and later. Most of the attack came through the instigation of the Arab state because they, they see that if this, a small nation, which has been isolated, it is only, you know, a Gaza Strip is hardly 363 square kilometers. Mm -hmm. And it is the most populated densely, heavily densely, densely populated area in the world. And then it is surrounded, you know, even Egypt has sealed the world. They mm. cannot go there. Even the tunnels, they, bolded, uh, they bombed the tunnels so that the Palestinians will not go the other side and purchase food, medication, and so on and so forth. Therefore, they saw in a threat, if this small entity, small area is able to be governed in the Islamic Sharia, and they are able to develop, then other, the so-called Islamists in this area, will also be fighting against the regimes in order to topple them. Therefore, it is better that this Hamas-led government does not, does not succeed. Well, uh, from what you are giving us, it seems that it's a very grim picture, because now Hamas has been isolated by, from internally and externally by the people whom they expect to offer them support. Mm. Don't you think that it is at this time that it is prime for the Palestinian people to consider what suggestion was on the table about creation of a two-state nation within Israel? Okay. You know, the, the Arab have a saying, even if the night will be long, no matter how long it will, it will be, even during, uh, during winter, but a time will come when the sun will set. And uh, when you see you are in a portion or you, you are in a section whereby you are, you are hit hard, you should know that there is light. At the end of the tunnel, there is light. This is a, is a picture which is there, but almost for two decades now, they, they have been able to study with all these hardships and difficulties. The two-state solution has been thought well before. The Palestinians and the Arabs did, did not ac uh, accept it in 1947. They accepted it in 1991. And from 1991 up to now, 27 years have elapsed they have not been able to realize the two-state solution. They met 1991 in Madrid, and there's a reason why they met in Madrid, but that is not for, for our viewers today. 1993, Oslo, A, 1995, Oslo, B, 1996, Gaza, Aria, Gaza, Jericho, and then uh, there was subsequent uh, Sharm and Sheikh in 2000. And in all these the discussions were the possibility of a two-state solution mm. whereby the Palestinians 
they will be able to govern themselves, and then the Zionists also, they'll be able to govern themselves. But what the Israelis have given the Palestinians during Yasser Arafat, and it is still on the table today, is what they called Hukmudhati. Hukmudhati means self-rule. The Palestinians have been given a leeway, a go-ahead by the Zionist state to rule their people, not the land. Meaningless. You rule your people, uh, and you find that during the, uh, uh, the end of the days of Yasir Arafat, he was, he was cornered in his house. Even, uh, even going out, he was not able. But uh, from uh, what we understand is this is a very small area. No. So maybe logically it would not even be feasible to create you know, an army, you know, to create a state with all the conditions that any state might want to have. And maybe that's why the Israelis have offered this kind of solution. But that is not a solution. And you know the Palestinians, they, they, they took it because they were they were lower in strata in the negotiation table. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they wanted at under whatever cost, even if it is self-rule, they'll not have a standing army, they'll not have police, they'll not have the economy, they'll not have, because th the land is not there. Well, Where is the economy without the land? Assuming that uh, today no. we went the way of the two-state solution, no. how would the Palestinians be able to economically sustain themselves in a state of their own, given all the hostilities that they're already facing no. from their neighbors and their Arab brethren in you the know, region. You know, the land of Palestine is very rich. If really the Zionists were sincere, and now they say we are going to give you a state of yours, then they'll be able to develop very quickly because already the Palestinians, they have manpower. You know, the, most of the Arab world was developed by, by the Palestinians. In education, they are very far. In matter pertaining to business, they are very far. In matter pertaining, so many things. In matter pertaining to agriculture, they are very far. If they are given the land, they are given the portion. This is your portion. And they accept that portion. And then there is no whatsoever interference from any quarter. Give them a decade. A decade, the economy would boom. You know, Pal Palestine. They were the, the, the ones before they were occupied. They used to they, they they used to export so many things. Yes, but the reality of the world today is no. such that the entire Arab world is currently in turmoil. No. Talk about Syria, talk about Afghanistan, talk about Qatar, talk about the Emirates, all over there is turmoil. And we know that for growth to be uh, attained, there needs to be some form of trade. One country trading with the other, the Palestinians, whatever they will produce, they need to sell to the neighbors and all that. Given this kind of tunnel, turmoil, do you think that there is a reasonable sustainability to sustain a new state in a very volatile region? The vol volatility is uh, our making. You know, we have reached where we are because of our... This, these are things we made with our own hands. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah to Shura, whatever, whatever happens in this world, you know, there was, there was, the Arab world was very stable. Mm -hmm. Even with the dictators, they have developed. But you know, the self-centered interest has made the Arab world, the Middle East, to be what it is. But if the Arab world, because they speak the same language, they, ha they are interconnected, they will be able to sit in one table, chalk the way forward. And since the majority, 90% of them are Muslim, and to let Islam now govern them, rule them, then there's no place on earth which will, be, will develop and will be peaceful. Like, because they have natural resource, they have whatever it takes. 
Uh, you have mentioned that uh, they have a lot of manpower. No. But the situation as we understand it today is that Palestinians have been exiled from their own land. And uh, one of the agreements that even there is a, a signed document with the UN among the resolutions is that the exiled Palestinians will not be allowed to return to Palestine. Lest you know they beef up the numbers and uh, they get to overrule the, 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 the Israelis then how do we expect them to develop given the limitation in terms of manpower? Manpower, first, if you look into the UN resolutions, they were very clear that the Palestinians should be allowed to return to their home state. Very clear. But as you said in our last program, that most of these UN resolutions cannot be affected forcefully. Mm -hmm. Israeli, the Zionist state, Zionist state are the ones who have disregarded this resolution. They say will not let the Palestinians, because the, Palest the uh, Palestinians in the diaspora, they're almost, almost 7 million. Now, if 7 million come, adding maybe the 3 million or so in, uh, in Palestine, they, they will be the majority. And once they are the majority, then they'll, they'll, they'll uh, fight for their rights. We want this one, we want this one, we want this one, we want. But even if, if these Palestinians in the diaspora, if you talked about peace and security, if the Arabs will be able to sit under one table, on one table, and agree to talk about peace, and agree to have security and safety in that land, the Palestinians who are in Palestine now are able to develop their land. Well, uh, we shall be taking a break, and uh, when we come back, we'll be looking at what is the significance of Jerusalem in all this, because we do understand Jerusalem to be that uh, holy land that houses uh, three distinct localities that are related to the three major Abrahamic religions. Thank you. Horizon TV, the beacon for the nation. Welcome uh, back uh, to the show. Tonight we are discussing the issue of Palestine and the unilateral declaration by Israel that Jerusalem will be their capital and what this decision portends for the nation of Palestine. Ustad Muhammad, Jerusalem, everybody is talking about Jerusalem. What is Jerusalem? Where is Jerusalem? What is this all about Jerusalem? Jerusalem, Jerusalem, and Jerusalem. Yes. A, a city which was established by Nabi Adam, alayhi salam. A city wherein when the Canaanites migrated around 2500 BC, established again that town, and they called it Orshalem. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it is uh, one of the oldest, oldest cities in the world. And we Muslims, we should go back to the name Jerusalem had. You know, one of the ways the, the enemies are trying to defeat us is to re rename cities so that the generation to come, if you are to tell somebody Jerusalem, Jerusalem is not any Islamic or Arabic name. Mm -hmm. I say this is a, a Zionist city or an Israeli city. Mm -hmm. And in Palestine, they have done it a lot. Mm -hmm. Most of the cities have been changed. And uh, we swallow the change. And uh, if you had to talk to people, maybe, uh, you know Al-Quds? Say, no. I don't know Al-Quds. Therefore, this is uh, uh, 
they are using all the, all the ways. And one of the ways is changing names. For example, Al-Quds, if you tell somebody a Muslim Al-Quds, uh, you know, is a problem. If you tell a Muslim, you know Ariha? Say, no. You know Khalil? No. You know Beersheba? No. You know Bethlehem? No. You know Akka? No. You know Haifa? All these names, Asqalan, even we have a scholar by the name Ibn Hajr al-Asqalan, mm -hmm. who was born there, educated there, taught there, even wrote the commentary of Sahih al-Bukhari, was from Asqalan, but now the names have been changed. Al-Quds to Jerusalem, Asqalan to Ashkelon, Akka to Akre, Ariha to Jericho, Khalil to Hebron, Bethlehem to Bethlehem, and so on and so forth. And we are, we are swallowing. Therefore, it is better we go back to our name so that generation to come, you know, one of the way to fight the enemy is to train the younger generation. Therefore, if we talk about Al-Quds, you know, Islamically, it is a very significant city because it is a city where, in, apart from the Masjid al-Aqsa, our Bayt al-Maqdis, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed the city plus the environs. Well, uh, let me get it from here. No. You're quoting from the Holy Quran no. that Allah has blessed the, enviro, the, the place and its environs. Apart from the, the mosque. Apart from the mosque. Yeah. And looking at it from the outside, no. it is the same narrative that is being given by the Jews no. and the Christians no. that these are blessed presents. No. So doesn't it get to fuel the fire that, I mean, if these are blessed uh, uh, area, no. why is it only one group which wants to have it to themselves? We no. also do have a right to this blessed area. No. That is correct. And during the Islamic rule, none of these groups were denied entry to Al-Quds. None they were given a free leeway to Al-Quds to go to their places which to them they say it is sacred or holy. And you know to the Christians, Bethlehem or Beit Laham mm -hmm. is holier than Al-Quds. Mm -hmm. Although there there is the holy sepulchre. Yeah. Mm. And there is uh, the church of nativity mm -hmm. and other churches. But you know, Beit Laham has been attached to Isa alayhi salam, mm -hmm. while Al-Quds has been attached to Nabi Allah Dawood and Nabi Allah Sulaiman. Mm -hmm. Where in now the Jews come in here? Mm -hmm. They say Nabi Sulaiman, whom they call Solomon, built the temple of Solomon. Mm -hmm. And what they say in their narrative that it is the Muslim who came, demolished the temple of Solomon, and uh, you know when the Muslim went there, it was an empty ground. When uh, uh, when uh, Omar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu and the other companions radiallahu anhum ajma'in, when they went there, it was an empty space. Uh, these mosques came later. There was no you know when the when uh, King Nap Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon went there, he, he was the one who demolished. When the Romans came. Well, it seems to be a war about who's superior to over the other, the other one, yeah. yes? And uh, again, it translates into which is the superior religion. Mm. Do you think that the three religions can actually coexist in this area? You know, they, they, they can, and they, they were coexisting. Mm -hmm. But during, only in the Islamic state. And you find that when, they, when they, the Jews were excommunicated, were killed in Spain in 1492. They, they, were, they, they, they migrated with the Muslims and then they entered into the Islamic empire whereby they were given full freedom to enter Jerusalem, Al-Quds, to enter other places without any restrictions. Well, and the restrictions came only mm -hmm. during the Ottoman Empire during the Ottoman Empire, especially during Sultan Abdul Hamid Khan II. You know, that was the period of Zionism. And most of the Jews who used to go there, or to be specific, the Zionists, they used to hide themselves 
they were not from there. They were from Austria, from Russia, from England. Therefore, they, because in their first conference they say the only way we can gain entry to Palestine is to migrate there. Mm -hmm. And we are not able to migrate there mm -hmm. and uh, purchase unless we go there, we hide, and then we stay for some time and then maybe get documentation. Mm -hmm. Therefore, Abdul Hamid Khan especially told the governor to be wary of these, but, uh, of these people. Of course, those who are coming from Yemen, from Egypt, were given free, the Jews, the Christians, were given free entry. Uh, to the Palestinian, no. is there uh, extra significance for Jerusalem apart from Baitul Maqdis, or there's no significance apart from them? You know, initially, when we started, we were supposed to, uh, to talk about the Islamic identity of Al-Quds and uh, Palestine as a whole. But maybe in summary, you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Isra, verse number one, says, Subhana al-ladhi asra bi'abdihi layla min al-masjid al-harami ila al-masjid al-aqsa al-ladhi barakna hawlahu. Say, glory be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who has taken by night his servant, his slave, from the sacred mosque in Mecca to the farthest mosque in Al-Aqsa, whose precinct environs we have blessed. This is one. And then Allah talks about specifically Palestine or Bilad al-Sham as a whole. In Surah Al-Anbiya, verse 71, he talks, We rescued him, Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam, and Lut, his nephew, alayhi salam, to a land we have blessed for the, for the whole world. Therefore, the center of blessing is in Palestine or greater Syria, which includes uh, Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, and also Jordan. Therefore, Islamically, Palestine is blessed. Islamically, Palestine as a whole is sacred. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in chapter, in chapter number 5, Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse number 21, talks about Musa when he say, when Musa told his people, Ya qawmi dukhulu al يا قوم ادخلوا الأرض التي كتب الله لكم ولا ترتدوا على أدباركم فتنقلبوا خاسرين الله سبحانه وتعالى talks about enter نبي موسى told his people the Israelites enter the land the sacred land which Allah has written for you and do not go back lest you are conquered lest you become the losers therefore Palestine as a whole is a sacred land, is a blessed land, and hence, and you find that there are other identities which show to that, and uh, especially in uh, Al-Quds, you find that you have the second oldest mosque constructed for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The difference of construction between uh, the sacred mosque in Mecca and Al-Aqsa mosque is 40 years only. Uh, in some uh, discourse elsewhere, no. there has been talk that uh, the, 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 the struggle in Palestine is all about, you know, uh, Muslims who have uh, conquest nature inside them, you know, as Muslims have been portrayed, no. that they have conquest blood in them and no. they would like to conquer everything wherever they go and all that. That is why there's all this struggle about Palestine because the question is, for Muslims, they say, that is, and if I may quote them, that you have your holy lands in Mecca and Medina. Mm. So what is your problem about all this? After all, this belongs to the Israelites. If you Arabs want your holy land, you already have it. Why do you also want this? Mm. This is, you're portraying your conquest nature. What do you have uh, to comment about this? But if you, if you look into history, if you look into history, as we said first, Masjid al-Aqsa was first and foremost constructed by Nabi Adam. He was not an Israelite. Well, could we say that... And then, uh, secondly, secondly, if you come, the reconstruction, it was done by Nabi Ibrahim and his son, Nabi Ishaq. They were both not Israelites. Therefore, the, the Israeli question is not supposed to be there. And, uh, you know, sometimes uh, some Bible verses are taken out of context. And, you know, the movement 
uh, of re-establishing uh, the rule of the Israelis in Palestine started way back in the 16th century. Maybe for the benefit of our viewers, no. could you explain where Israelites start from so that it is clear if we look at the genealogy of the prophet no. to know where the Israelites now creep in so okay. that we can remove all these, you know, everybody has been lumped up together that oh, it belongs to the Israelites. Where do the Israelites start in history? The, 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 the Israelite started in history with the birth of Nabi Yaqub alayhi uh salam. -huh. Whom among the prophets could be maybe at what point? The at 12th, uh, 15th, 30th? Uh, you know, there are 124 messengers, 124,000 messengers and prophets. Yes. Those mentioned in the Quran are 25. Mm -hmm. Therefore, Nabi Allah Yaqub is in the middle. In the middle. Yeah. Because Nabi Allah Yaqub comes immediately after there is Nabi Ibrahim, Ismail, the Ishaq, and then Yaqub. But before that, we have Nabi Adam, you have Idris, you have Nuh, uh, you have Hud. And Nabi Ibrahim had, uh, you know, four wives. Mm -hmm. Out of these four wives, you know, in all these four wives, he had children. Mm -hmm. Therefore, with Hajar, he had Ismail, the eldest son. With Sarah, he had the second eldest son, uh, who was Nabi Allah Ishaq. Now, Nabi Allah Ishaq, Nabi Allah Ishaq gave us Nabi Allah Yaqub. Nabi Allah, Nabi, na, na, Nabi Allah Yaqub had also four wives. He had 12 sons and one daughter. Now, these 12 sons of, because the other name of Nabi Allah Yaqub was Israel. Israel. Therefore, and hence in the, the Quran, it terms Bani Israel, mm -hmm. the children mm -hmm. of Israel. Now, there it started. Mm -hmm. Now, these 12 sons were born in Palestine. Mm -hmm. But Nabi Allah Yaqub did not have the power. He was a prophet, but the power was with other people. You know, even Nabi Allah Ibrahim, mm -hmm. you know, since he was a, a godly man, God, Allah conscious, he was able to interact even with the pagans to make da'wah over Tawheed to them. Mm -hmm. There were those who became Muslims. There were those who did not. They remain with their superstition. When Sarah died, he didn't, although, you know, if you look into Genesis, they say that, uh, you know, God looked with favor to Abraham and he said, you know, you climb into a mountain, whatever you see is for you and your progeny. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the Israelites and the Protestants, uh, Christians, they have taken that, as we said in the 16th century, when Protestants, uh, uh, Protestant was started, Mm -hmm. protest against the Catholic, you know, they took these statements and then they, they, uh, they took it up, mm -hmm. the issue, and say, in order for the Messiah to come back, the Israel, the Israelis should, the Jews should be ruling that Palestine, land. that yeah. land, mm -hmm. the, uh, the so-called uh, Israeli land. When now the Jews have the power, Messiah will come, he will turn these Jews into Christians. Well, uh, could we quickly say that uh, maybe all this fight about Jerusalem is because it's considered biblically to be the cradle of mankind? Bibli and Islamically also. Okay. Therefore, the Muslims fight for it, the Jews fight, fight, fight for it, and the Christians also. Because the Bible, uh, although the, the, the Jews, they only take, they, they take the Old Testament, but in the Old, Test Old Testament, the Christians also take. Therefore, they say this is a holy land. And during, uh, when it was ruled by Islam, they were given, you know, one thing, during the time of Prophet Muhammad, mm -hmm. and uh, during the time, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and during the time of Abu Bakr, Omar bin Khattab, you know, when the Muslims, they went there, you know, the Romans, even during the time of the Prophet, who were Christian, they fought against the Muslims. And hence, armies were taken, were, were sent to those areas. And one of the area is uh, Al-Quds, and when they reached there, Sophronius, who was then the patriarch of Al-Quds, said, okay, I'll surrender, but your, your leader should come and take the keys of the city. Mm -hmm. You know, when uh, he went there, Omar bin Khattab, when he entered while walking, his slave riding on a, on a, on a, on a horse, he said, these are the signs we have, been, we have been told that the one who will come and take the key will have. And in the, they had a, a famous uh, agreement. And one of the agreement, 
you know that Sophronius, Sophronius put is that no Jew should be allowed to live in Al-Quds. But during the, you know, there is uh, Ahad Omari, the mm -hmm. agreement of Omar. Uh, and this clause was put by Sofr uh, specifically was put by Sophronius. But uh, the Muslim, you know, they are tolerant people mm -hmm. and they tolerate all people. And later, uh, the Muslims, they allow. These are human beings, are humankind. They are, in fact, uh, the Arabs and the, and the Jews are cousins. If you look into, into the genealogy. genealogy tree, you yes. find that they're cousins. Their forefather is Nabi Ibrahim, Ismail, the father of the Arabs, and then Ishaq, the father of the Jews. Back to modern times. Modern times, okay. We are living in a world whereby uh, most uh, Palestinians are living in exile. No. And uh, the issue is that they are viewed with suspicion all over wherever they go no. because uh, of their situation. No. And also there's the fear that you have rightfully mentioned uh, uh, initially in the program that uh, they may arise or they may awaken other citizens in the Arab world. How do we expect them to continue surviving? In this way you know nowadays those who are are put in that clause are not only the palestinians mm -hmm. the arabs and the muslims in general yes you know that uh, that now the name terrorism is synony synonymous to a muslim mm -hmm. you know even if you maybe sometime you travel outside especially if you travel into non-muslim land you enter with a with a council and a, a cup like mine everybody will be looking at you. Uh, mm -hmm. is, this, is this guy okay? Is this guy, uh, won't he or she maybe ripped us off? Mm -hmm. Therefore, everybody is looking into every Muslim, Arab, even sometimes maybe some of those Arabs are Christians. Mm -hmm. And you know, in uh, Palestine, there are so many Christians and they have churches. But uh, you know, the Jews, they don't, they don't choose. I say the only Palestinian who is uh, good is the one who is dead. One of the major uh, contributions of the Palestinian struggle to the modern world is the, what we can call the Palestinian kaftan, no. which uh, used to be adorned by right. the, the late Arafat. Yasser Arafat. No. And uh, today it has become a symbol of defiance against any oppression. Uh, do you think that it is a positive symbol? Yeah, it is. Because, you know, once especially those who know uh, the kaftan or that piece of cloth, especially the Palestinians. And you find that even in their, when they have a celebration, you know, they wear it and they, they have those uh, songs which show that uh, they should defy and they should struggle uh, till uh, either, either you are killed or you attain independence. Therefore, it is a, a good sign that uh, this defiance and this struggle should continue. In uh, one sentence. No. How does the future of Palestine look like? The, 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 the future look grim, the, but the future in the grim side, there's a, the, the bright side. Well, viewers, there you have it. You've heard all about the history of Palestine. You've heard about ancient Palestine. You've heard about Palestine in the Middle Ages. And you've heard about Palestine today in the modern world. What is happening in Palestine is nothing but a whole load of knowledge and it is knowledge for everyone for the economic students palestine is all about how people can survive with limited resources for the political science student palestine is all about the way nations engage with each other for the religious study students palestine is all about the study of patience and the study of the trials that you will be put through as you get to exercise your faith so thereby you have it. We should always have Palestine in our hearts and in our minds for the struggle continues until we do get to attain the full independence of Palestine. Thank you. Horizon TV, the beacon for the nation.